The year is 1988. Chrysler is getting pummeled by Ford and GM in sales, and the company's lineup of cars weren't inspiring consumer excitement. They needed a new, exciting car, and fast. Company Vice President Bob Lutz was driving to work in his 1965 Shelby Cobra when it hit him. The Cobra was exactly the kind of car Chrysler needed to add to its repertoire. So Bob put together a team, gave them a three-point directive, and the rest, as they say, is history. The result of Bob's efforts was the iconic Dodge Viper. How did Lamborghini help Chrysler build an engine for a Corvette killer? Was the Dodge Viper almost the final nail in Chrysler's coffin? And does a car need windows to sell? If they don't pass gas, it's the story of the development of the Dodge Viper. Pass gas podcast. It's about cars. It's not about ports. You guys want to hear a quick horror story? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So. This woman, she moves into like a penthouse apartment. Nice. Okay. Scary. Oh, I've read and, the magazine. And she sleeps there. The morning she gets a call and she picks it up. Uh-huh. This gravelly voice on the other side of the phone. She she hears, I'm the Viper. I'm coming. Whoa. And she's like, what? She hangs up really quick. She's like, what the hell is that? She's kind of worried, but she goes on with her day. She gets another call about an hour later. I'm the Viper. I'm coming. And she's by this point she's kind of freaking out, you know. She's yeah, like, Who, yeah. "Who's the viper? Why is he coming?" <sighs> she's like so scared at this point, and she hears a knock on the door, and she's just terrified. And she goes over, she, oh, he goes, "Who is it?" And she hears, "I'm the viper. I'm here to vipe and wash your windows." <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Hell Great yeah, story. Dude. Joe Weber <laughs> here on the podcast. My name is Nolan Sykes, James Pumphrey, Yo. and Jeremiah Burton joining us once again. Hello. How are you, Jer? I'm You're good. hurting if it ain't a real Burton. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of fake Burtons out yeah, there. So many fake, fake Burtons, Burtons out there. I'm actually a fake Burton. I have a profile called Jeremiah Jerton. Oh, yeah. Uh, so even that. <laughs> Nice. No, we're doing Dodge Viper. Dodge Viper was the uh, center of like the very the first very first wheelhouse. Wheelhouse right, with you the, ever made. the Maisto diecast model. Um, I watched that the other day. Yeah, was it why it's good. sports it cars have stripes? Have uh, racing stripes? Why yeah. racing stripes? Yep. Um, yeah, it's been Dodge Wi Dodge Viper. It's been <laughs> Dodge Viper week for me here at Donut. Uh, but doing a lot of research for another big. Viper video that we're shooting tomorrow, Jerry. Yeah, um, excited. Very Big excited for Viper this video. Oh, actually, we've already shot the video. <laughs> it's already come out, and if you've seen it, then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we we're researching for I drove every Viper, so I've been having. A, I read a whole book about the Viper. Mm-hmm. My co-writer Tiernan has also re- read the book. Obviously, it's one of our favorite cars. Um, one of my favorite cars for sure. Uh, that diecast model I have, 1997 GTS Coupe. That's your favorite that, one? That's a dream car for me. So Not there, even the ACR? I I mean, obviously the ACR. I mean, I wouldn't superior. kick it out of bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're telling me. Um, but there's just something about, I just have a nostalgic connection to that, the, the 97, the second gen in particular. Yeah. So, what's, your, what's your color, Nolan? I'd go red and white stripes or okay. blue yeah. and white stripes. Blue and white stripes. Yeah. That's my color. Did you know they made one that was red with yellow wheels? I did. I think yeah, Hulk, Hulk Hogan. Hogan. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Hulk Hogan had it, which makes sense because it was Hulkamania fever. Yeah. That beats my um, Randy Macho Man Savage Chevy HHR. <laughs> 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 that's that's his car, you know, post wrestling days, you know? Yeah. Like, that definitely fits his personality. <laughs> <laughs> like you could tell there's buffness under there yeah but you know it wasn't red or blue but bit. it was uh like slim jim wrapped <laughs> oh yeah oh they also there's slim jim brown yeah textured <laughs> the, <laughs> the first generation she's got was, wrinkles in those yeah, yeah. she was experimenting with textured paint at the time <laughs> <laughs> you could also get a first generation in like this green but it had yeah. like a a little flake in it, flake and like a turquoise mm-hmm. element too. It's more of like yeah. a really dark turquoise. Mm-hmm. I would also get a first gen in that color too. With one the, of those with po- the three spoke wheels. Ooh, one of those <laughs> popped up on Craigslist about a month ago, 
It was green oh. with, uh, but I don't know if it was that emerald green, but it had a brown interior. Brown interior. Yeah. That must have been repainted because, according to my research, those only came with gray interiors, the oh. green ones. So <laughs> who knows? Okay. Brown um, and green are very snake colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brown and green. Yeah. Watch out. <laughs> brown and green, really mean. <laughs> green and brown. Bring Friends in town. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love that yeah. everyone kind of half knows that coral snake king snake I, thing, I but still don't know. you still don't know no. it. <laughs> but, I don't know, but I love how everybody was taught it. Like that was a thing we needed. I was to know. never taught. What do you, I thought you just made that joke. Yellow up. Red touches red. You're freaking dead. Yeah. Oh. Red or touches yellow. Chill. It's freaking mellow. But those <laughs> are the yeah. Those are the same things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> red, yeah, it's like red touch. Yeah, no one knows. We'll just no red knows. on black. Take it back. Red <laughs> on yellow. He's a nice hello. fellow. He's a hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello. Hello. He's a good fellow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Snakes. Uh, quicksand. You do watch out. Quicksand is real. Oh yeah. Three yeah. things I was gonna. We had to deal with way more in our lives. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. Quicksand was a thing that scared me. Like I would be walking across and <laughs> well, get you could actually that encounter that in your day day to day, day in, in Florida, right? Maybe. Maybe. I don't yeah, know. They got quicksand down there. And, you know. <laughs> I'm sure we got some sort of uh, in the trap in the in the swamps. Yeah, in the swamp. Yeah. yeah. Down in the bayou. In the bayou. <laughs> bayou oh, of Florida. Daddy said I ain't allowed to go get no gators in that bayou. <laughs> Catch your palmetto. Cook him up for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> After Bob Lutz arrived at Chrysler headquarters that fateful day in 1988, he sought out a specific well-known car designer with some serious credentials. Tom Gale was known for designing cars like the Plymouth Barracuda and the Dodge Challenger, cars that transcend generations, and he was perfect for the job. And even though Bob Lutz didn't know his exact specifications yet, he had a few details in mind. He wanted a two-seat sports car with a big engine and a manual transmission. And Bob knew his car's name, the Viper. Mm. Well, we'll get to the naming process in a little bit. Evan. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted his creation to be the new and improved Shelby Cobra. And to do that, you've got to give it a snake's name. Rattler. Lutz and Gale decided that the Viper would be the everyman's alternative to the Ferrari. Affordable, in quotes, but flashy. Gail set to work, and when he later showed Lutz some half-scale clay models and drawings of his initial ideas for the car, Bob was kind of blown away. <laughs> he was kind of blown away? <laughs> yeah, a little, I'm just a little bit blown away. Uh, kind of. i to be honest here, guys. I'm a little bit blown away. <laughs> they decided to unveil a prototype at the 1989 North American International Auto Show in Detroit. The reaction was overwhelmingly positive. Virtually every automotive publication in the country loved the Viper. In Lutz's words, when we unveiled the car, it blew the roof off. Nothing remotely like it had ever been displayed by an American or foreign volume producer. Which is interesting because the car didn't have a roof. <laughs> yeah, so this prototype that they showed off at the show, uh, this was like a clay model. It did have an engine. It was able to, it was able to putt around a little bit. But because of the way the steering had been, they hadn't figured out the sus mm -hmm. steering or suspension or anything like that. So it could only move the wheels like 10 degrees either way uh -huh. uh, to maneuver it around, to putt it around to shows. Chrysler in the mid or the mid to late 80s was in a really bad spot. They had just gotten out of like a they, bad relationship. Yeah, they had avoided bankruptcy. They were selling a lot of economy cars uh, and that kind of sullied their reputation you know back in the 70s they were very well known chrysler very well known in the muscle car scene they were making some really crazy and high performance stuff but now they're kind of like a, a sad shadow of their former self they made a so, bunch of tan cars that made 78 horsepower yeah. so they needed a car to kind of revitalize the brand image bob lutz made it clear to the team that uh, creating the dodge viper would be a quiet project done quickly and done correctly there would be no mid-development update to the public, no grandstanding. The car would be built or it wouldn't. The team, led by chief engineer Roy Schoberg, was given 85 engineers, as well as three rules for production, okay? Team Viper would receive a $49.9 million budget, about $98 million today, and were given 36 months to develop and produce the car, and had to do so, quote, ethically, morally, and not get Lutz in trouble. 
What does that mean? Yeah, what is it? Yeah. I'm I how not are, really sure exactly. <laughs> how are they making cars weather. unethically? Yeah, so, how are they making cars where they had to be like, all right, guys, this one, we're going to do it ethically <laughs> yeah. and morally. Mm-hmm. Okay? Well, I like, think what? maybe he's saying, Impossible. like, don't make your engineers work 22-hour days or something. Uh, yeah, maybe. The last rule was in place because Lutz wanted to give Tom Gale free reign to make the dream car a reality. Um, that $49.9 million budget, mm-hmm. that was... Because apparently at the time in accounting at Chrysler, that kind of rounded down to zero. And if you went above fifty million dollars, that's when like the no wonder they people, were doing bad. Yeah, the accounting yeah. people would uh, start to take notice. <laughs> that's <laughs> such a what? Yeah. what? Fifty million dollars? Yeah, that's nothing. That yeah. could go no, missing no. unnoticed. Yeah. Well, hey, I mean, by comparison, I, this is from my research. I'm going to be chiming in a lot on this. One. I know. Uh, in 2020. The auto industry spent twelve billion dollars on advertising alone. Jeez. So, I mean, auto companies work with an immense amount of money. This is not any money to yeah, develop. This is a drop in the bucket. Yeah, and there's no time. Zero. Three years. The LS four hundred was d- being developed at the same time, and it took a billion dollars just for the engine. Yeah, four hundred. Yeah, four hundred million dollars just for the engine in that thing. But let's be honest, the the engine. Pretty good. Mm. Pretty good. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Chef's kiss. Mm. Chef's kiss. Mm. Chef's kiss. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Delectable. If Chrysler was going to attempt to take on one of the best sports cars ever designed, they had better do it well. As if to hammer this home, the guy behind the Shelby Cobra, Carol Shelby, was brought in in an advisory role to further the Viper's agenda of becoming the Cobra of the 90s. They actually got Shelby on board so they could have Shelby convince Lee Iacocca to approve the project. Oh, uh, because they're boys. Yeah, because they were friends. Uh, Iacocca and Shelby had worked together before. Did the they f- bring Shelby on before the concept car or after? Yeah. Because so it's before. a very Shelby-shaped car. Yeah. They definitely wanted to uh, pay homage to the Cobra in shape and, and proportions and everything. They brought him on. This is before that initial prototype was unveiled. Uh, but he, he stayed on as an advisor uh, like a consultant for the rest of the project. A lot of people say that like he helped really like design the yeah. car. He was more of there. I mean, he was pretty old at that point. Yeah. And like, and he never really like, like designed designed his cars. He had a team of great engineers and designers. That he's would, a vibe guy. He's, he's a vibe, the vibe guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, Rick Rubin, James with, Pumphrey doesn't know how to do anything. Great vibes. vibes. Rick uh, Rubin is knows everything. <laughs> he knows how to do everything. No, he doesn't know how to do anything. No, he does. No, he doesn't. <laughs> he does. No, he said he doesn't. Guys, do you want me to call I know, him? No, but he actually does. <laughs> he does? Yeah. He's okay, just being yeah, humble. me too. I know how to do everything too. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Give me that camera. Yeah. I'll take the wrench from now. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Working on Team Viper was no easy task. Or as Schoberg put it, quotes To get on the team, you had to give up your day job. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, assigning these 85 engineers to a concept car project was actually a personal risk. Since Viper had a 36-month development window, this meant that lower-level engineers would need to apply for other positions on different projects at Chrysler, so they'd have a backup in case the Viper project failed. I just realized that instead of, you could say three-year, right, 36-month, but they say it in months because they're the babies. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Because the Viper program was based on concept designs, management wouldn't even approve the car until halfway through those 36 months. Like when it starts talking a little bit. What they did, Tom Gale and Bob Lutz walked through the Chrysler engineering office, and how they thought they could choose the right people for this project was... Spiky if, hair. If anybody had like motorcycle helmets at their desk, they'd be like, I want oh. that person. And they had they a had... fake snake and they would throw it at people and <laughs> yeah. if people didn't react and yeah. they were on the team. If they had like pictures of like race cars in their cubicle, mm. they were selected. Or like pictures of their own race cars. Like Whoa. those were the people that they wanted involved. They want people who are personally passionate. So it was a bunch motorcycle. of like twelve year old kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They all had they all had Diablo posters <laughs> on their own. And Carol Shelley picked Someone because they had a crock pot of chili going. <laughs> yeah, I want that guy. Before design could be considered, a powertrain and underpinnings were required to set the dimensions of the vehicle. The long nose, short nose. I mean, you look at that car; it does look like the head of a snake. Mm-hmm. Sure does. Carol Shelby, who was conveniently working with Dodge at the request of Chrysler Chairman Lee Iacocca, Lee Iacocca. the previous relationship, insisted that a V8 would be ideal for this kind of project. However, Dodge engineers had other ideas. With the assistance of Roush Performance, they grafted together two 
Chrysler LA V8s together to create an 8-liter iron block V10 initially designed for trucks. This would be the test mule to culminate the famous Viper V10. This was only the beginning of the engine, though, as Chrysler had made an important acquisition a year prior in 1987. So the real genesis of the Viper was the V10 that Dodge was developing for their trucks. They wanted something that had the torque of their diesel, but mm -hmm. cheaper because the diesels were very expensive. So they figured a V10 was the best way to do this. Bob Lutz, Tom Gale, and Francois Castaing, who was from Renault, all three saw that and said, hey, it'd be very cool to have a V10 sports car. Mm -hmm. And Bob Lutz was like also obsessed with the Cobra, and that's how this all came together. My math's not adding up. <clears throat> yeah, two V8s is They a, took two a cylinders 16. from one of the two cylinders from one of the V8s and inserted so it like into this the, way. Like like you got yes, a yes. V8 to V8, you take two and you then just move take, it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's it's not like a V16. It's like a Yeah. They borrowed some cylinders. Gotcha. Yes. So they kind of took what they knew, yeah. added a couple cylinders. And that the the 360 that they were working with was a really reliable engine. And uh, they actually stuck with that architecture for a long time. It had the same uh, spark interval, same crankshaft design, pushrod V8, no mm -hmm. overhead cam. Even the latest ACR doesn't have overhead cams. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, they made an important acquisition in 1987. Oh, I know who this is. In 1987, Chrysler purchased the remnants of AMC, American Motor Company, and along with that came a certain Italian manufacturer known for being plastered above beds. Like a poster. Yeah, not, a poster, not drunk not on drunk. top of a bed. No. <laughs> That's uh, me. <laughs> This manufacturer was Lamborghini, a company well accomplished in vehicular pursuits, uh, but best known for their roaring engines and also not making money very good. <laughs> <laughs> After the acquisition, Chrysler sent engineers to Santa Agata. Yeah. Santa, yeah, that, that sounds Santa good. Gata. Santa, Santa Gata. Gata. Santa Guta. After the acquisition, Chrysler <laughs> sent engineers to Santa Gata, Lamborghini's home base, on six-month rotations to gather as much information and know-how from one of the best in the game. One thing that came from this development was the exchange of the iron block for an aluminum one better suited for the new lightweight Viper. Yeah, they sent the drawings for the iron V10 that Dodge was developing over to Lamborghini, and they're like, hey, like, what can we do to make this aluminum? I um, tell you one thing. It's a little heavy. Yeah, it, it sure is. It's uh, a heavy but... meatball. Make it aluminum. <laughs> yeah, so we make it more of a um, they, meringue. Lamborghini had <laughs> ideas to like make it a very like race-oriented motor. I think it had like, op not an open deck. Yeah, maybe open deck. Like very big cooling channels and stuff that Dodge was worried would make it less suited to street driving, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> like a Lamborghini. Like a Lamborghini. <laughs> so they they took some revisions. It's kind of like a misconception that Lamborghini designed the entire engine. It was a very close collaboration between Team Viper and Lamborghini. And Lamborghini learned a lot of production yeah, processes. Yeah, Lamborghini ended up making a V10 a little bit later. Uh huh. For the Diablo uh, and the Gallardo. Oh, yeah. That was with Volkswagen, though. Yeah, but, yeah. but still, it's like we've already we've already made the one. It wasn't just like a one way. Deal. The Diablo is V twelve. Yes, it is. Gallardo's V ten. Huracan's V ten. Was it Countach V ten? No, Countach V twelve. Um, they learned a lot of production processes from Dodge because mm -hmm. they, you know, they're doing everything hand built, and they're that was one reason that they were losing a lot of money as well. So it was like a two way kind of. It, they exchange ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, right now is a heavy like a pudding. You make it light like a pancetta. <laughs> You're mixing dessert with uh, appetizers there. What's pancetta? It's sliced <laughs> ham. Mm. Mm -hmm. What's the Italian? Uh, gabagool. No, gabagool is a meat too. <laughs> What's the like? Panna cotta. Panna cotta. I love panna cotta. <laughs> It's a, it's a Bodino right now, but it could be a Panna Cotta. Oh, yeah, that's good. He's Italian. You listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quick side note. The partnership between Chrysler and Lamborghini Machine also produced the Diablo, one of Lamborghini's most favorite models, my favorite one. If I could pick any car, that would be up there. Uh, but Chrysler had to show Lamborghini that they were the new boss baby in town, and they did so 
by making sure that the production V10 in the Viper would be two liters larger than the Diablo V12. Uh, this wasn't so much to snub Lamborghini as it was to show as it was to show the automotive world what Chrysler was trying to do. As development of the Viper program progressed, engineers understood that with such a low budget and little oversight, many C-suite uh, Many a C-suite was watching from the shadows, as they do. For this purpose, and one that we'll discuss in a moment, Dodge produced two test mules similar to production design and offered different powertrains. VM01, as they called it, was the first of the test mules and came with very different features from the production car. VM01 was special for these differences. They used the original iron block V8 to simulate the weight of the V10 on the front suspension. Oh. Yeah, I think it's just they used a... Yeah. Yeah. VM01 was special for these differences. They used the original iron block V8 to simulate the weight of the V10 on the front suspension. Overall, it offered similar styling to the car shown at the Detroit Auto Show. Overall, it offered overall it offered similar styling to the car shown at shown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, there's a car distracted me. Oh, is that the is Civic? The yeah, probably pulling it out. Overall, it offered similar styling to the car shown at the Detroit Auto Show. One of the biggest reasons VM01 was created, other than testing, was to keep executives interested. They got short attention spans. Mm -hmm. We got, need to see what all this money's yeah. going Look towards. over here. Yeah, look over here. We, what do we got to do? What are you <laughs> even working on? Yeah. Ooh, there are a lot of people, me. surprisingly, at car companies, there are, it's not just filled with people who love driving and love cars. What? Uh, <laughs> when, <laughs> even back then, uh, uh, Tom Gale would take people out. Not Tom Gale. Uh, engineers, Team Viper engineers would take executives out in the VM01. Uh -huh. And even though it didn't have the V10 yet, it still was a pretty raw, mm -hmm. loud car. Mm -hmm. And take so, them for a few laps around the test testing facilities, yeah. and they'd be like, oh, I understand, I understand. now why we got to build this. I burned my ankle really bad, yeah. but I understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It's like that scene in uh, Ford v. Ferrari when he drives the- Yeah, uh, yeah, at uh, the airport. Yeah, yeah. he drives uh, Hank Deuce around the airport, and he just starts crying. Yeah. <laughs> and he poops his little pants, yeah. and he ejaculates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a pretty powerful scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah they didn't show really, that uh -huh. in the movie, but it's a fact. He yeah. yeah. pooped version. his pants, yeah. and then he ejaculated. He actually won an Oscar exactly. for the scenes that weren't in the movie. Yeah. That's He's, never he, happened before. Yeah, he won no. him. Bonus, bonus scenes, Oscar. Oscar. Best yeah. actor. That's actually a great... That's a great category. Yeah, that should be a yeah. thing. Best actor category in a cut four. scene. Yeah, best actor <laughs> in a cut scene. <laughs> best actor with two or less lines, less than yeah. two lines. There should be bit part Oscars. Yeah, 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 for sure. sure. Yeah. With all this money invested, engineers knew the program would stick around if there was a car for management to drive. The guys putting up the money need to see the progress. Mm -hmm. They need to stay excited mm -hmm. because they get easily distracted. I want to know what you're doing with all my money. What are you doing with all my money, Bob? <laughs> As we mentioned, Carol Shelby firmly believed the car should have a V8. So even though the team was working on the V10, Carol still had his V8. Yeah, Carol Shelby was skeptical that they'd be able to develop a V10 that was light enough uh, for a sports car like this. A big, heavy iron block V10 like the truck version would be too heavy to uh, let the car rotate enough. But, you know, they got it done. VM02 was a similar car to the first design, but carried a different weight under its hood. The iron block V10 designed for truck use had been thoroughly looked over and tweaked, and then overhauled to produce 360 horsepower, which is as much as a Hyundai now. <laughs> uh, this was important from a testing standpoint, as the team could now work with more data from an engine. Uh, but it also showed them that building a V10 was viable. The first cast uh, the first cast aluminum blocks to be produced for the Viper were done in Italy at Lamborghini headquarters. Chrysler sent an engineer to report back on any problems they experienced during the production. And after four weeks, the team in Michigan received three lightweight, high-performance aluminum V10 engine blocks. Hell yeah. Yeah, after the V10s were delivered from Lamborghini, all the other tweaks and uh, revisions were done by Chrysler. And Chrysler and Team Viper tried to keep as much of the 
uh, Viper, or sorry, the Lamborghini styling as possible. The Lamborghini makes a good looking engine. They do. It's one of the only engines that, you know, you see it from the outside of the car. You're like, oh. It's so pretty. It's a focus point. Mm -hmm. And it's made entirely out of gabagool. <laughs> When designing the Viper, the production team focused heavily on who the car's demographic was, and it was pretty easy to summarize. People with jean shorts, Corvette owners, <laughs> and anyone looking for an unbridled V10 experience. The Viper set its eyes on the Corvette ZR1 as its target, and even bested it when Motor Trend reviewed both cars in 1992. Uh, are you interested in a bridled V10 experience? <laughs> I want one that's unbridled, actually. Oh. Hey, guys, who wants unbridled? <laughs> As the Viper came to be, VMO2 was used to drive and show top brass what they could expect in terms of sound, handling, and inkling of performance. One morning in the fall of 1990, Bob Letts took Chrysler's king, Lee Iacocca, out in VMO2 to determine his feelings on the car. The team knew that Iacocca's opinion was gospel to automotive aficionados, so this was one of the most important rides VMO2 had been on to date. After the drive, Iacocca opened the red-painted door and said, Well, what are you waiting for? Build it! With Iacocca's blessing, the Viper team had found the confirmation they so sought. But we're still a bit nervous about mass production. The Viper needed to be just as good as Iacocca thought it to be. This was a kind of a little staged event in front of a bunch of automotive journalists he invited them out. Yeah. They watched Iacocca get driven around in this big red car, and yeah. then he... Gave his line. Very he, old school Detroit. A lot of showmanship. Got to get the, what are you waiting? And so he looks at me and he says, what are you waiting for? Build it. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a story that's told in every executive boardroom yeah. for the next 30 years. It's going to be a thing called podcasts. So yeah. These, these jerks are going to make one about he it. He made Lee Iacocca like spray his hair back <laughs> when he got out of the car and get out with like an excited look on his face. The final piece of development the Viper needed was the gearbox. Now, you might recall from earlier that the original engine design for the V10 was designed for use in trucks, as was the five-speed transmission that VMO2 was outfitted with. I just realized that VM probably stands for Viper Mule. Probably, yeah. Which is oh. a cool animal. Dude, Viper Mule? <laughs> yeah. He's mm. stubborn and venomous. <laughs> To deal with the un he he to deal with the ensuing buffoonery of high rev clutch dumps, Dodge understood the need for a strong transmission. Dodge first reached out to their German supplier Getrag, who came up with a six speed that Dodge didn't think could handle the abuse. The ensuing back and forth resulted in Getrag offering to outfit the transmission with upgraded, stronger internals. If Dodge would pay double the price and provide R&D money up front. With no room left in the budget, though, Dodge would have to look elsewhere. Sure, we can make it better, but it will cost you <laughs> twice the price and money up front. <laughs> the supplier they went to next is well known to fans of American muscle like Jerry here. Mm -hmm. They went to Borg Warner. Borg Warner got their name inventing the sliding clutch, but was most well known for their reliable gearboxes. Dodge was lucky, as BW was already designing a transmission with General Motors for the new Camaro and Firebird. It was the same T56 transmission that's in your catfish, Jerry. Yeah, old reliable. That's right. And with some alterations, they were able to produce the parts Dodge desperately needed. Uh, yeah, so General Motors already working with Borg Warner. They were happy to collaborate with Dodge because not only was it going on those F-bodies, but they knew that they were going to be coming out with some um, bigger motors later on, and they'd, they'd be using that same transmission. So General Motors almost used Dodge as their test bed for future cars oh. yeah. with that transmission. They're like, okay, if it works in this powerful Viper, it's going to work in some of our newer cars later. So right. That's different than I pictured it in my head because in my head I was like, oh, Dodge is just looking at GM's homework, you know? No, I mean, it's a very very collaborative process. But you, you think know? about it too, Borg Warner likes it because they're both – Two huge manufacturers mm -hmm. making thousands of transmissions. Yeah. yeah. They're going to want guys, that. We're going to sell so many transmissions. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I think we're going to sell a lot of transmissions. <laughs> <this year. laughs> oh, no, I'm double, double dipping. Uh, I mean, you know me. I don't want to celebrate until the paint, until the ink dries, but you know, I got a feeling it's so much transmissions this year. <laughs> and of course, the T56 went on to be. Produced by Tremec. Tremec bought the design from Borg Warner. Now, 
you know, you might have a Borg Warner T-56 in your car. You might have a Tremec T-56 in your car. It's the same transmission. After only 33 months, it was time for Dodge to unveil the production Viper just in time for the Detroit Auto Show. Perhaps predictably, the crowd went a wild. <laughs> Dodge had worked particularly hard to keep the new Viper under wraps, so the public was rightfully shocked that the production model resembled the show car so closely. Like the Shelby Cobra, the first Viper didn't include a single feature that wasn't essential to make it go faster. There was no air conditioning, no ABS, no stability control, no power locks, no freaking door handles, no roof, no windows. All right, You buy this car, you're still technically homeless. <laughs> Uh, it didn't have a lot of that stuff because it did resemble the concept car so much. And when you're designing a concept car, you don't necessarily think about things like, hey, when we roll down the windows, are they going to fit in the door? Yeah. Or like, how do we open the door? You know, and so they ke they were so uh, they kept so closely to the concept that they were just like, do we even need door handles? <laughs> no, turns out we don't. Buyers loved it. The Viper RT10 forewent all creature comforts in the name of driver enjoyment and experience. And also, it saved Dodge a lot of money to not include any of that. Crap. Yeah, I didn't think about that, yeah. but don't include all those things. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to think about your AC system. You don't have to think about your anti locking yeah. system. Or That's supply. thousands yeah. of dollars. Yeah, yeah just car. the. Per car, it's thousands of bucks. Yeah. And, and parts, but then the design and development yep. of it That's is expensive. way more. Yeah. Well, I was like expecting the Viper to be like a real parts bin special. We had a first gen here mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. And I was walking around it, like really just like scrutinizing and being like, oh, what's, which neon parts are on this SOB? <laughs> and there's some that you can tell come from other cars, but. Most everything on that car is It's mostly stuff that you wouldn't really even notice, like side uh, markers. Side mark on the ACR that we had in here. Mm -hmm. The side markers for that were from a Fiat 500. Whoa! Ooh. Yeah, so that, I mean that's a spirit. The the spirit of money saving really lived on throughout the entire run of the car. But it's really just in the interior with those climate control yeah. knobs, maybe door handles and mirrors. But oh, that 90s Dodge plastic, <laughs> yeah. gray plastic. Yeah. yeah, Jimmy said that the vi the first gen Viper smells like a McDonald's play place. <laughs> That's something. what I was gonna say. Yeah. It seems like they took McDonald's like seats, melted yeah. them down, yeah. and then used that plastic to form the dash. There's a great uh, short Dodge Viper history video by our buddy Four Eyes that you can check out, and he found out that the headlights from the first gen Viper were actually already designed for a uh, BMW concept car that they were gonna put into production but never did, but the headlight manufacturer had already had the tooling and everything, uh -huh. so they saved a ton of money and they had to get those headlights and kind of reshape what the hood and the grill looked like. I could not imagine a 90s BMW with those headlights. I know, right? That's probably why they canned it. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine this being yeah. a BMW. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, the all-red exterior performed a siren song for the masses. As each person approached the stage, the same wonder and excitement brewed. Orders began to pour in, and calls on how to make the waiting list came almost as quickly. But some celebrities tried to bribe Bob Lutz to get their own Vipers, Dame Judy Dench, which was actually pretty smart because Dodge produced only 285 Viper RT10s in their initial release year, 1992. It became the ultimate status symbol. Uh, Kurt Cobain drove one. <laughs> <laughs> and this exclusivity uh, boosted sales to 1,043 by the next year, 1993. This was also the year that the team added a black paint option known as Viper Black. Did Kirk Cobain actually drive? <laughs> no. I was like, that does not yeah. seem like him at all. Yeah, him being bummed was just a front. He loved Dodge Vipers <laughs> yeah. and, and Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> he had Buffett buckets by the, like, thousands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kirk Cobain Buffett. was a partial owner of Margaritaville. <laughs> yeah. There's, a like, some unreleased Nirvana tapes mm -hmm. called the Parrot Head Sessions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> away again in Margaritaville. yeah, he wrote that song. <laughs> yeah, he wrote Margaritaville. Yeah. <laughs> Looking for a mile, a shaker of salt. Hey! Wait! <laughs> In 1994, the team added green and yellow as well. Dandelion yellow. Dandelion yellow. Emerald green. Very 90s looking color. 
The Viper was a massive success with rave reviews across the board, except for some owners who said the side exit exhaust burned them any time they got out of the car. Huh. Don't put your leg next to the side of your car when you get out. Yeah, you got to hop. Have you ever gotten in one? Did you sit in that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not good for tall guys. It's pretty hard. (laughs) It's a very difficult process to get in and out. The pedals are like over here. Yeah. Uh Yeah. Pedal position sucks. I think if you drove a Viper for years, you would probably have hip problems. Oh, maybe. Mm -hmm. Hey, wait. My My Viper causes pain. Uh, and my hips from driving sideways. Hey, wait. My hips are so displaced. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Past Gas by Donut Media is sponsored by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a really long process, especially because we're always growing and changing. One of the ways that you can understand how you change is through therapy. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. It's literally just talking to someone and talking about feelings is always good. As someone who is new to therapy at some point, I think BetterHelp was the easiest way to get into it. I cannot stress how convenient BetterHelp is. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash passgas today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash passgas. Thanks, BetterHelp. Also, the lack of electronic interference wasn't so great for less experienced drivers. Uh, A lot of people crashed them, but that's like... Driving's harder than people think, Mm -hmm. and a lot of people buy a car that's really fast, and they're like, oh, I can do, like, the TV, and then you don't. You can't. It's hard. It's wreck. It's 400 horsepower, and it's, like, 2,900 pounds. Yeah. Rear-wheel drive with no ABS. No ABS, yeah. 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 No electronic aids. Just your skill. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, you don't just automatically know how to handle that. Yeah. It's like people being like, oh, yeah, I can ride a horse. (laughs) No, you can't. (laughs) You don't know how to do that. I cannot ride a horse. Out of principle, dude, I'm super, loyal to cars. Superman couldn't ride a horse. <laughs> dude, nobody can ride a horse. Horses are terrifying. They're yeah. giant. You can see their muscles, and they have hammers for hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sometimes people like they purposely put steel hammers. Yeah, on the bottom and they put freaking steel <laughs> yeah. on the bottom of the hammers. Yeah, what are we thinking? <laughs> that is silly. Dude, horse. once AI learns how to ride a horse, we're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As 1996 rolled in, so too did the second generation of the Viper, and with it came a rear exit exhaust, because everyone's a snowflake these days, glass windows, <laughs> and a roof. That's, and some electric it nannies wasn't like a for, roof. It wasn't for owner uh, safety, is because uh, the side exit exhaust created a lot of back pressure, mm. and doing rear exit exhaust freed up a lot of horsepower, actually. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. The more it you wasn't know. wasn't because safety. No. No. Good. <laughs> they they wanted the burned legs. They wa- I yeah. mean, that was part of the appeal. Mm-hmm. Hardcore. <laughs> it was a status symbol. If you had little burn marks on your ankles, mm-hmm. people knew. Yeah, it's like foot binding. <laughs> <laughs> the GTS, as it was called, allowed for some of the raw nature of the Viper to be hidden from the driver, but also increased the V10's output from 400 horsepower to 450 horsepower. The 1996 model year also introduced another cool color to the lineup, blue with white racing stripes yeah. down oh, the man. top of the car. Yeah. yeah. Very Shelby, baby. Yeah, it's gone full this, Shelby. Uh, they, were, they actually consulted with Pete, Pete Brock, the guy who uh, developed the Shelby Daytona uh, for this car. Um, he was like a consultant on there. He like gave it. He gave his uh, approval, and obviously, yeah, very uh, Shelby. He put his sweaty little Brock fingers all over yeah. it. Well, I mean, he was like, "Yeah, it's cool. It's cool <laughs> if you do this as an homage to me." Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 1996 was a huge year for Chrysler because that's when they decided to take the Viper racing. In the early 90s, first-generation Dodge Viper RTs had been modified by racing teams for use in GT racing in North America and Europe without much success, but it was time to adapt. In the U.S., the value of the car was clear. 
In Europe, however, the car came across as brutish and American, which was not a compliment. To inspire European buyers, as well as show the world the handling capabilities of the car, Dodge decided to enter races across the pond. And thus, the Chrysler Viper GTSR, or in American races, the Dodge Viper GTSR, was born. There's a couple seasons where it even wasn't even for sale in Europe, mm-hmm. uh, but it was called rebranded as a Chrysler over there and uh, entered. I wonder yeah. if they oh. use Chrysler instead of Dodge as a more like, oh, it sounds a little bit fancier. Well, I think it was just probably in the markets that were required. Like they probably sold Chryslers. Yeah, mm. I don't, I don't think they had Dodges over there. Mm. Anyway, the upgraded car, the GTSR, premiered at the 1996 IMSA GT Championship with the team Kanaska Southwind. Its first race was at the 24 Hours of Daytona, where it finished a it finished 29th out of 76 entries, but improved by the 12 Hours of Sebring, where they finished 12th. A private team out of France was called Oreca was hand selected by Chrysler to take the wheel of the Viper GTSR, and both they and Kanaska Southwind signed up for the Creme de la Creme of 24 Hour races, 24 Hours of Le Mans. Three of four Viper cars finished, with the Kanaska Southwind earning 10th overall. That's uh, reliable. It's pretty Three good. out of four? Pretty good, yeah. Mm-hmm. But Areca had a great run with the GTSR as well. Yeah, that's a bit of an understatement. They had a legendary run with the GTSR. <laughs> Within two years, Areca's GTSR won 16 out of the 18 races it entered. Sheesh. It took P1 in the GT2 class at Le Mans with an 11th place finish overall, and in 1999, the Areca Team Vipers won 9 out of 10 FIA GT races held Jeez. that year. And who won the 10th race? Another Viper piloted by former F1 driver Paul Belmondo. 1999 was also the year Areca won its second Le Mans GT2 victory, and Vipers held six of the top 10 finishes in the class. The Viper was absolutely dominating endurance racing. In 2000, Areca decided to take on American racing as well and won the inaugural race of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series season at the 24 Hours of Daytona. After the nine-race season, they went back to Le Mans again <laughs> to win the GT2 class for the third time just for good measure. You know, it's been a long time since I had some fromage. <laughs> I think it's time to go back, boys. This car is the red with white stripes Yep. Uh, with yellow fog lights mm-hmm. in the front. That's the Areca. Dude, uh, I'm sure Corvette was pissed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's. I just watched like a highlight reel of it was at Road Atlanta Viper versus Corvette in like the late '90s. That classic yellow yep. and black Corvette, Corvette versus the red Viper is amazing. Yeah, Viper one. In total, 57 Viper GTSRs were built. Some were used by the factory teams, yet others were sold directly to consumers to use in whatever series they'd like. The Viper GTSR continued to be built into 2005, after which Oreca refocused on supporting their existing fleet without adding new cars. But Chrysler decided to end backing in 2001, even though teams would continue to race Vipers well into the 2010s. Let me just bring up my little fact sheet here. Viper won 42, quote, world-class events, so that won 42 races between 95 and 02. There was also different motors you could choose to buy, too. For whatever, depending on the class you wanted to run. So okay. one of them had like, I want to say like 600 or 700 horsepower is like the top one. And that's like if you're going for the overall win mm-hmm. at Le Mans, mm-hmm. which I don't think it ever did, unfortunately. Was there like a smaller one? I think so. Yeah, that's what I'd want. Yeah. I'd want like a Viper with like a six liter V10. <laughs> Meanwhile, the third generation Dodge Viper entered showrooms in 2003. These featured restyled angular bodywork as well as a redesigned V10. The car received a 50 horsepower increase as well and lost over 100 pounds from the previous generation. I love when a car loses weight in an update. That's fun. Even though it looked a little bit bulkier, it was, in fact, lighter. The one thing that hadn't changed, however, was the heat created by the massive V10. Owners complained that the car would heat up on the inside of the cabin, but that's what you get for burning 12 miles per gallon in the city. I know. From 2003 until 2005, the Viper was once again only available as a convertible. That's not even like my Forerunner was nine miles to the gallon. Yeah, that's practically so pretty good. Practically great. <laughs> Though the GTS Coupe model returned in 2006, it was only for a year because in 2007, Chrysler was once again in financial trouble. Mm. Chrysler loves being in financial trouble. Dude, they can't, they're addicted. It's their comfort zone. 
Sales plummeted and the company was in the red. So Chrysler's parent company, Daimler Chrysler, decided to sell it to an investment fund at a huge loss. For context, Daimler-Benz had purchased Chrysler for $37 billion in 1998, but sold for a mere Seven billion dollars wow. in two thousand. That was to a firm I think called Cerberus. 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 What and a loss! Dude. Yeah. So nine bit. years. I'm doing the math here. They lost thirty billion bucks. Mm-hmm. Eh, pretty good math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, the Viper returned in two thousand eight in typical Viper fashion, meaning it was given even a more power, baby. <laughs> The SRT10 boasted 600 Hershpers and a new transmission that claimed to be faster than a ZR1 Corvette. Yeah, so just like how the uh, the second gen Viper was kind of like a do over of the first gen Viper, this time uh-huh. with more time and money, the Gen 4 Viper was kind of the same thing. It looks very similar from the Gen 3. It's actually kind of hard. I can't really tell them apart, to be mm-hmm. honest. Yeah, they're, they're stylistically very similar. It's because they, really, the they didn't really care about the styling this time. Everything underneath, like, is completely revised. The engine's different. Every All the suspension geometry is totally different. They really focused on everything mechanical being as best as it can be. It kind of sounds like the Gen 2, the Gen 4, and the Gen 5s are, like, the ones the to one buy. get without, mm-hmm. with as few headaches as yeah. possible. Yeah. For what it is, these are astonishingly inexpensive compared to get, stuff that yeah, comes close to being this wild. You can get Gen 1 Vipers for like mid 30s. Right. I just I was just looking at miles. I looked uh, there's a green one with the camel interior mm-hmm. sold on Bring a Trailer last year mm-hmm. for like 44 grand. Yeah. That's Bring a Trailer. Mm-hmm. There's one I sent in the Slack. It's green, but it's got the gray interior. Mm-hmm. 39.5. What the heck? Like, we should all get Vipers. I know, 25,000 miles on it. Dude, if we all had Vipers. <laughs> That's dude. pretty astonishing, actually. I know. Clean title. It's cool. Let's all get Vipers. Let's all get Vipers. Well, oh, who would crash a Viper first? <laughs> Me. <laughs> Kane, actually, Kanan. Kanan would. Kanan would, yeah. Kanan would, yeah. Eddie. Oh, Eddie would. Eddie, Eddie for sure. Eddie and Kanan would Dean. crash into Probably each other. Dean. Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Dean. we can't give Dean a Viper, dude. He no. can't have anything he, nice. Yeah. His, his big old shoes will get caught in the gas. Yeah. <laughs> his big old wing tips. <laughs> uh, Fiat bought Chrysler in 2009, and even though some folks thought the Viper would get some update thanks to Fiat's ownership of a little company called Ferrari, Dodge announced that they would stop producing the Viper in July of 2009. But first. A new model, the Phase 15 Viper. The Phase 15 Viper had a more aggressive face, 640 horsepower, and looked just as sleek as Bob Lutz (laughs) (laughs) had dreamed it would. (laughs) But as problems with manufacturing began to mount and buyer interest waned, I mean, the the economy was doing very poorly at this time. Dodge saw the writing on the wall. Production ended in 2010 as Dodge again refocused their efforts on the upcoming fifth generation. Well, it's interesting that they like took a year or two off. It's so it's so bizarre. But it's be- like they're like Jay Z. It's like we're I'm retiring. Actually, <laughs> actually I'm bad. not. But that's because it was so cheap mm-hmm. relatively to like the entire lineup. Like they the companies could afford to give. <laughs> the team like 50 million dollars mm. it's astounding when you think about over the course of the viper's life if every generation is between 50 to 100 million dollars they spent less than half a billion dollars to develop like five, five cars, cars. Yeah. which is astounding yeah five like exotic sports yeah. cars and that's why they have some issues. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you can buy them for 40 grand. Yeah. <laughs> the final iteration of the Dodge Viper came in 2013, but VIPs and executives knew what to expect as early as 2010. Uh, there are some big changes, and the redesign of the fifth gen Viper was more than just paint deep. The body had been fully redesigned using carbon fiber and aluminum. The power had increased to 640 horsepower and 600 foot pounds of torque. Those are just a couple of the many changes Dodge made to the Viper. To turn it from a great road car into an incredible track car. Actually, I would say vice versa. So a guy named Ralph Giles uh, was head of Dodge uh, product development. Um, and he, you know, he went to Sergio Marchioni, the guy who ran Fiat, and gave him a key to a, ten, or, uh, a 2010 Viper and just said, hey, like, drive this. Tell me what you think. If you like it, I really want to do it again. Yeah. And then he got out and said, 
Why are you taking so long to make these vipers? Get going. <laughs> Get going. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Sergio saw a couple benefits to making another viper. One, to kind of, like, refresh Dodge's flailing reputation in the automotive industry. Once again, like the first-gen viper, another viper was necessary to kind of, like, hey, let's make this non-lame company cool again. Yeah. Or make this lame company cool again. Two, uh, to boost morale at Chrysler. And three... To keep Ralph Gilles at Dodge because this guy, he's like a pretty big name in the industry and they wanted to hold on to him as long as possible. I think he's still with uh, Chrysler today. These track car developments culminated into the production of the Viper ACR Extreme. The ACR Extreme was an extremely fast track-focused variant of the Viper designed to take back many track records past generations that set. The rear wing and front splitter are the most striking design alterations, producing a total of 1,700 pounds of downforce wow. at 177 miles an hour. The book I read actually said 2,000 pounds of downforce, so anywhere in between there. Tomato, tomato. Yeah. A ton. Do That's a ton. <laughs> That's a, a lot. metric friggin' Tizoni. <laughs> Dodge hadn't forgotten its beginnings, however, as that very wing made a point of measuring exactly 1,776 <laughs> millimeters across. The same year that the U.S. declared its independence. Bah, 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 yeah. bah, bah, bah. I remember thinking that was really cool. Yeah, millimeters, the American <laughs> unit of freedom. <laughs> Imagine if it was 1,776 feet across. Yeah. It'd be well, a pretty cool wing. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, <laughs> 1,000. People in the head. 1,622. One across. 21 across. January 6, 2021. Oh, well, all the money. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> Nolan is always screaming, let's go, Brandon. Yeah. Yeah, because that's Cause your, your real, real name, name, dude. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you're usually doing something pretty cool, yeah, so yeah. I would lay off him. Let's go, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah's first name is Brandon. <laughs> Jeremiah's his middle name. He goes by that. Because he's a, a liar. <laughs> <laughs> it's a curse my parents have mm. given me, and I have to deal with it. The 2016 ACR stormed around the U.S., crushing lap records tracks such as Willow Springs with a 121.24 lap time. Uh, uh, Jimmy oh. knows of a Civic that went around Willow in 19 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Single overhead cam. Oh, wow. VTEC kicked in. Woo. Yeah, yeah. Laguna Seca was 128.65. The tracks were simply no match for the overwhelming power and prowess this final b Viper brought to the table. When the dust settled... The Viper took production car lap records at 13 different tracks. Wow. Well, I remember when this car came out, it was just like so sick. Posting them up. So yeah. sick. Just like. It looked mean as heck. Yeah. yeah. We were like, oh, dude, if you know how to drive this thing, this yeah. thing's going to be brutal. It was just checking off boxes. Mm -hmm. Just. Just. Marking them. And it did Nurburg. <laughs> do we have Nurburg ring stuff? Just crossing putting, things off. Putting stamps on yeah. the side of the plane. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Putting the notches in the bedpost. Notches you know in the bedpost. It just made love to everybody. <laughs> I'm just a notch in your bedpost, but you're just a lap in a car. <laughs> ACR. As the end of the Viper's run neared, Dodge was hesitant to try for a Nürburgring lap record due to cost and availability. So, a crowdfunded team from the U.S. took two stock ACRs to the ring. Of course. Two cars were brought to the ring along with two drivers. You had GT racer Luca Stoltz, who was the first driver to attempt the time, and the laps in the morning went just as planned. It wasn't until Stoltz turned up the heat did the Viper falter at 170 miles per hour near the top speed of 177. Stoltz's front left tire exploded, sending him into the pits with shockingly minor damage. Stoltz had his tire replaced and returned to the track. What? That's got to be pretty freaking scary. 170? Yeah, I'm saying, what a pop. G, dude. <laughs> like, we fixed your tire, you're ready to go back Oh, again. nice, nice. Yeah. I'm going to finish this Baconator. <laughs> <laughs> we had to fly it in from America. <laughs> yeah, I'm on a diet. I only eat Baconator. <laughs> The return lap would be short-lived as a drain plug near the rear differential had not been completely tightened. Uh, Mario! Of, uh, <laughs> devoid, of, <laughs> devoid of fluid, the differential seized. Viper number one was toast. The second driver, German racer Lance Arnold, would seek great success. I'm sorry I did that. <laughs> On Arnold's first full-speed lap of the course, he would set a new record for production cars. Seven minutes, one second, Ooh. point three. 
This victory cannot be understated, especially as the previous record was also set by the team only months prior at 7 minutes 3 seconds, 0.23. What happened next, however, ended the Vipers' jaunt for glory. As Arnold attempted his second full-speed lap of the course, he suffered nearly the exact same tire failure as Stoltz. At 160 miles per hour around a bend, Arnold's tire blew, sending him and the Viper into the barricades. It must be producing so much downforce. Yep. That oh, it just smashed like that? Yeah, yeah. that Whoa. it gets smashed, it, especially if it's in a corner and yep. all that load is on it. Yep. That's got to be crazy. terrifying. Yeah, because I was thinking like tires like, went like that, but no, it's like that. It's like, yeah, Whoa. pushing down so much. Uh. Whoa. <laughs> Arnold was safe after the crash, suffering very minor injuries, but the Viper was out. This may seem like a winning story, but both drivers were convinced that the car was extremely capable of going below the seven-minute mark if it weren't for those dang tires. But let's not sell the Viper short here. This trial showed the world that the Viper was the sixth fastest production car ever around the Nürburgring. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be enough to save it. The last Viper rolled off the assembly line on August 16th, 2017, sporting the same red paint as its first model 25 years earlier. Though there doesn't seem to be a future for the iconic sports car right now, we can only hope that it comes back from retirement a third time. Now I'm like we've joked about all getting Vipers, but this is like a good investment. Yeah, <laughs> Dude, when, the, when these were being sold in 2017, yeah. I was like, I want one of these so an bad. ACR, an ACR, because they Dude, were like so sick. you could get one for like a hundred grand, mm -hmm. and now they're two hundred sixty thousand dollars. There's a couple. Yeah. I remember ACRs near the end of it with. They were just sitting at dealerships because it's Couldn't get not a very it. good street car because right. it's got these huge yeah. carbon fiber pieces all over it. But we and you've got to be good to drive it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to shoot at this place, like this private collection, uh, and they had one. And like every time I'll go there, I'd just be like, oh, holy moly! Look at this thing. <laughs> it's really it is such a striking a car yeah. when you see it in person, and you don't see very many of them. You don't because yeah. they didn't really make a lot of them. Right. Last time I was on. Um, Melrose Boulevard, there was a guy in a, uh, in a red That's GTS. a skinny street to be riding a Viper on. <laughs> and I was like, D and all these people were taking pictures of it. It was like a That's brand sick. new supercar because you yeah. just don't see them anymore. Yeah. The <sighs> Viper will always be synonymous with American racing, even if you see one lose a race to an Integra online. Unabashedly <laughs> raw, the Viper knew its place in the market, even if buyers weren't always so sure. From having no glass to go in full fishbowl in the GTS, the Viper came a long way from its iron block V10 truck engine origins. All in all, the story of the development of the Dodge Viper is one of heartbreak, romance, and burnt ankles. Very nice. Yeah, I mean, it's just it, a lot of things went their way. It's amazing that this car was even There's allowed to be like built. nothing like it. There's nothing else like it. You could not build a car like the first-gen Viper anyway today. It's um, not like Ford has a Viper. Compare. No, no, it's a very strange car uh, in that way. It's aimed at Corvette people, but it's like way more hardcore than yeah, Corvette. Absolutely. Want, and that's but, part of its downfall. I and think. that's the, the cool thing about Dodge, I think, is that this was a, at, you know, even now in today's standards, a supercar killer. Mm -hmm. Not much money, but is like extremely capable. Yeah. To For Ford to do that, they'd have to build a GT, which is crazy money yeah. you know like dodge has something about it where you can go get i mean we just got done driving a um what was it a hellcat mm -hmm. and that thing's insanely fast and super cheap anyone could go you know yeah. not anyone but a lot of people they're like attainable you yeah know? dodge has this for whatever reason i think they have this like hey we're gonna give you performance at like pretty reasonable price mm. it's probably because they have low self-esteem <laughs> <laughs> they have a hard time asking for what they're worth it's like a hot boy who just gives it up to everyone right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly yeah yeah exactly, nolan. exactly. <laughs> yeah nolan <laughs> we have some uh listener mail this week hey guys i'm david from utah i'm a bus driver and spend eight hours a day oh. listening to you guys while i drive around thank you very much david from utah I've seen my view of cars has changed a ton. I'm more excited about pretty much everything and have opened up my eyes to different sides of the hobby. You know, lifted dually trucks with military tires, dumping smoke are still dumb. You won't change my mind. I will not argue with you on that, but maybe. I think they're cool. Come at me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Nolan mentioned. <laughs> Google me, ho. Yeah. Nolan mentioned his sim racing. What? Google me, ho. Nolan mentioned his, maps. his sim racing oh, hobby before. I want to hear his setup. Thank you for all you do for the community, David Broadhead. Uh, my sim racing setup 
unfortunately, since I moved in my new place, I don't have enough room right now. It was a uh, uh, Fanatec um, Club Sport wheel, and then for pedals, I had Logitech, but with instead of a potentiometer, I put in this new sensor that makes it a lot stiffer and like more accurate, so you can do trail braking a lot easier. And then I just had that's that on exactly my desk. the opposite of my setup. I have a Logitech G27 wheel Which and some my Club Sport wheel. pedals. Yeah, weird. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Whoa. Dude, high five. All right. Great. You got <laughs> you're like a senator and you're like a Minotaur. A minotaur. Oh yeah. A minotaur with just really hairy. And I'm a legs. Hufflepuff. <laughs> anyway. I'm Gryffindor Ravenclaw Rising. If you <laughs> if you'd like to get in contact with the show, hit us up at passgas at donutmedia.com. We'd love to hear from you. You can follow our guest, Jeremiah Burton, on Instagram at Jeremiah Burton. You have a TikTok as well. What you doing over there? Uh, not much, man. Not much on the TikTok. Yes. Uh, check it out. But check it out. There's a, there's a couple videos on there. Jeremiah Jurton's my name because someone took Jeremiah Burton. Uh, that happens. It happens. But you can always be Brandon I'll Burton. Sell it to you. I could. <laughs> uh, but thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. Man. We've already shot the video. By like, the time you hear by this. By the time you hear this. But, but we're doing it tomorrow. But we're doing it tomorrow. I'm so excited. I'm looking forward to it. We got to be careful with those things. Man. Oh, dude. Yeah. We got insurance. I'm not worried about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Knock on wood there. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow James at James Pumphrey. Google me, ho. Follow, <laughs> follow me at Nolan J. Sykes if you'd like. Big thank you to our writer this week, Connor Cota, and our producers, as always, Christina Felsky and Gavin Kinzel. And also, if you'd like to watch your podcast, we're doing video again now. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.